Tis a dump, Mona said. Tis grand, Shane said, looking around. For an hour or more they had driven under the prow of a mountain in search of a restaurant that would be quiet but also cheerful. And now they had landed themselves in this big gaunt room that seemingly served as both ballroom and dining room. A microphone on a metal stand took pride of place and a bit of orange curtain lay crumpled on the bandstand as if someone had flung it down there in petulance. One end of a long refractory table was covered with a white lace cloth under which there had been put a strip of red crepe paper and it was there they would most likely be seated. It was late spring and when from the roadway they had spotted the rusted iron gates and the long winding avenue, they thought how suitable and how enchanting it seemed. Moreover, the hotel had a lovely name, Glashine. They drove up the long avenue, trees on either side, oak, sycamore, ash, all meshed together, fighting amiably, as it were, for ascendancy, and birds in their evening sallies, noisier than the pigeons, who cooed softly in their roomy roosts. A battered jalopy with a for sale sign stood in the car park that was separated from a nearby meadow by a rope of green cable. A sign on a post read, danger, high voltage. And from a metal box, there came a burping that every few seconds rose to a growl. Close to the entrance was a butcher's van with the owner's name printed in tasteful brown lettering. And on the step, a child's tractor filled with toy soldiers and wooden blocks. In the hallway, a nest of candles glimmered on a high whatnot and a luxuriant flowering plant trailed and crept along the floor, amoeba-wise. The petals were soft, velvety, black, with tiny green eyes, pinpoints, and there was something both beautiful and sinister about it. She had never seen a black flower before. Since nobody answered, she went into an adjoining room where a man had his face so close to the television screen he seemed to be conversing with it and took no notice of her. Two dogs dozed on a torn leather armchair. Presently, a girl came, a strapping young girl, who could not say for certain if they did or did not do dinners, as the season was not yet in full swing. Nevertheless, she led the way to the gaunt, cheerless dining room. They had driven so many miles, first to a town with a lake and a round tower where they had strolled, then sat on dampish, rough-hewn picnic stools and noted to each other how strange that others who had driven there had simply sat in their motor cars and stared out at the lake. He liked being with her. She could feel that. She didn't know him very well. She had volunteered to give painting lessons in the prison in the Midlands, where he was serving a long sentence. Though many came for the first few classes, they eventually dropped away, and by the end, Shane was the only one. Sitting with his back to her, finishing off a self-portrait, which was in viscous gold and mustard yellows, she had asked him if he had ever seen the paintings of Van Gogh, to which he said he hadn't. She was reminded of Van Gogh because of the upturned stump of a sneaker on which the dry paint bristled. Walking in the graveyard beside the round tower, she had asked very quietly, how do you find the world, Shane? Since he was only out of prison a few short weeks. Crowded, he had said, and half smiled. While he was in prison, his wife had been shot, bathing their child, shot in lieu of him. And not long afterwards, the child, who was being reared with relatives, had also died of meningitis. On the evening that his wife had been shot, he had gone to sleep while it was still bright. And though the warders knocked and pounded on his cell door to tell him of it, he did not hear them. He reckoned that in sleep, he was postponing the news that he could not bear 
but would have to learn to bear. How he managed never to crack up was a mystery to Mona. A few days before Christmas, the governor of the prison had rung her to tell her that there was a parcel left for her in his office. It was the portrait, wrapped in assorted carrier bags, and on the greeting card he had written, For Mona, I'm sorry it's so crude. Something about the message seemed unfinished, as if he had wanted to say more, and it was this hesitancy that emboldened her to ask if he would like to meet in Dublin when he was out. He was due out that spring, but it was kept a secret to avoid a media jamboree. She knew how reserved he was, he having mentioned that, though he ate in the refectory and played tennis three times a week, he kept to himself, and the best times were at night in the cell, listening to tapes of Irish music and songs. She imagined that on those nights, he would mull on the past and on the future, too, possibly envisaging how the world had changed in the 15 years since he was captured. It was a hair-raising capture that attracted the attention of the nation and confirmed him as a dangerous outlaw. It so happened that he was released three days earlier than he had expected, and she could scarcely believe it when he telephoned her in the studio in Dublin and said somewhat bashfully, it's me, I'm free. They had made an appointment to meet in a hotel and standing on the steps on a crisp frosted morning, the winter boughs and branches in the park across the way, jeweled in frost, she had felt he was not coming, that something had prevented him. After almost an hour, a young boy in a braided outfit came and told her that she was wanted on the phone and brazenly repeated Shane's full name. He was in another hotel a mile away and she told him somewhat sternly to wait there and not to budge. Sitting with him in a booth of the second hotel, drinking tea, there was a tentativeness. It was strange to see him in a gaudy shirt and jeans because in the prison porter cabin where she had visited him, Everything was muted. Moreover, a policeman had always stood behind them, listening in, except for the odd time when he took a stroll, maybe to smoke a cigarette. They had not shook hands when they met on the steps of the hotel, but she knew by his way of looking at her that he was glad to see her, and he remarked on her hair being much nicer, loose like that. For the painting class, it had always been tied back and made her look more severe. So you're free, she said. I had only 10 minutes warning, he said. How come? Uh, the governor came down to the sewing room and said, you have a car and driver at your disposal for 24 hours. It'll take you anywhere you want. As he spoke, she recalled the shiver she had felt as the governor told her that there were many people who wished Shane dead. You mean the Brits? Them and his own feuds, feuds. Put it this way, he'll always be a wanted man. And he raised his arm to fend off questions. What were you sewing? She asked in surprise. Ah, bits and pieces for the lads. Zips, darns, patches. There was a long queue. Who taught you to sew? We were 10 children at home. The mother had a lot of other things to do, he said shyly. So the lads will miss you. They might, he said, but without any show of emotion. Then looking straight ahead, he began to roll a cigarette, thoughtfully. He seemed then to be the very incarnation of loneliness isolatedness. Some friends had pulled together to get him a second-hand motor car and a few weeks later he suggested they drive out to the country of an evening. It was agreed that she would travel by train and meet him in the town about eight miles north of Dublin where he had found lodgings with a black woman who chattered all day long to her hummingbirds and as he said did not ask questions. Now they were in the big dining room famished and waiting for the owner to come and tell them what she could possibly give them to eat. 
When she met Shane, as arranged at the railway station, he was sitting against the outside wall eating an ice cream, and she wondered why a wanted man would sit there, visible to all, in his new jeans and jazzy shirt. His car was a little two-seater with a fawn coupe top. They had tried various restaurants along the way, to no avail. In one, a sullen owner pulled the door barely ajar and said there was no hope of teas as he was laid up. Several times she got out of the car and went in, only to discover that the restaurant was too rackety or too dismal. She joked about these places when she got back, described the tables, the lighting, the dried flowers and so on, giving each place marks ranging from one to ten. Shane didn't talk much, but he liked letting her talk. The years inside had made him taciturn. Judging by the newspaper photographs, that had been taken on the day he was captured, he had changed beyond recognition. He had gone in, young and cavalier, and had come out almost bald, with a thin rust moustache that somehow looked as if it was spliced to his upper lip. He said once to her, and only once, that she herself could be the judge of his actions. He had fought for what he believed in, which was for his country to be one, one land, one people, and not to have a shank of it cut off. When they came to the gateway leading to Glashine, she felt it was ideal, so sequestered, and the building far below smothered in a grove of trees. Holding open one half of the iron gate, she had put a stone to the other half. She saw to one side a public telephone kiosk, that looked glaringly forlorn, the floor strewn with litter. The horse chestnut trees were in full bloom, pink and white tassels in a beautiful droop, and in the meadow lambs bleated ceaselessly. It was pandemonium, what with them bleating and racing round in fear of losing their mothers. It's like a maternity ward, Shane said, and she wondered if he'd ever been in one as he was already in prison when his wife had given birth. Only his wife truly knew him, and she was dead. Looking then at the stranded microphone, she said it was lucky they hadn't come on a dance night, as she was not a dancer. Me neither, Shane said. Oh, you dance if you were made to, the owner said as she hurried in, drying her hands on a tea cloth, and told them about the lovely hunt ball they'd had in the winter. People from all round, gentry and farmers and cattle dealers and highwaymen and God knows what. Are we bothering you, Shane said. Aren't she what I've been looking for, she said, and led them across to the long table that stretched almost to the window. When he sat down, he smiled. It was the way he smiled that drew people to him, and the owner, quick to recognise it, introduced herself as Wynne, and said proudly that they were in luck because her good-for-nothing husband had caught a salmon and she would poach it along with potatoes and cabbage. Meanwhile, she said, they could tuck into the drink and she would bring bread to mop it up. There was a slight hitch as she was inexpert at opening the bottle of wine which Mona had already ordered. The corkscrew buckled and bits of crumpled cork floated in the pale amber liquid. Just enjoy the view in the rolling countryside, Wynne said, and sallied off, muttering what a nice man Shane was, and what nice manners, and how manners maketh man. This is nice, he said. He liked the wine, though he was not used to it. She could tell he was not used to it because his eyes became a little foggy, like steam on a kitchen window when pots are boiling over. They could hear Wynne talking to the dozy girl in the kitchen as their arrival had created a little flurry. Your eyes are the colour of tobacco, Mona said. Is that good or bad, he asked. It's good, she said. Turning to Wynne, who had just come in with a loaf of bread, he asked what the room rates were for the night. We could negotiate that, Wynne said, and winked as she toddled off. You're not thinking of staying in this dungeon, Mona said. Uh, no one would find me here, he said gravely. 
Where will you live, Shane? Maybe in the West, he said, but vaguely. She pictured him in some cold, isolated cottage, by himself, wrapped in an overcoat, on edge, day and night, on the lookout. Do you worry about reprisals? she asked. I'd be worried for others, he said, and looked at her with such concern, such tenderness, across the reaches of the wide table, the flames of the stout candle guttering in the breeze from the open window. Do you think you'll go back to... The fight isn't over, isn't done, he said grimly. She didn't ask anything further. There were always distances between them, a part of him cut off from her and from everyone. How different the two hymns, the young invincible buccaneer and the man sitting opposite her, aging and dredged, everything locked inside him. It's all right, she said, not even sure of what she was saying. It is, he answered, also unsure. The poached salmon was a sturdy lump from which the head and tail had been cursorily lopped. The skin hanging in a long shred looked like flypaper, and though the outside was cooked nicely, the inside was rawish, and around the bone the juices were a pale blood colour. Wynne hacked it jubilantly with an old carving knife and conveyed pieces onto Sean's plate with bravado. Then she picked up a boiled potato with her bare hands and filled his plate in her desire to please him. Mona asked for a smaller portion, as Shane apologised for the mound he had been given. There'll be jelly and custard, so leave a gap, Wynne said, and went off proudly humming. Very soon after, he listened, as if he had heard something that was no longer the bleating lambs, because in the fading light, they had gone quieter. What? Mona asked. Car. The car drove at a hectic speed, lights full on, and then drove off again with a vengeance. Ah, youngsters, hoping there was a disco, Wynne said, having come back in with the white sauce for the salmon. But he was not listening to her. He was only listening now to his own thoughts, and his appetite had gone. He drank a few more swigs of the wine and jumped up. Toilet, he said, and reached out and touched her sleeve. She watched him go, something so wounded about him, his clothes clinging to his thin body, his sleeves rolled up as he tugged at the loose doorknob. Then, peculiarly, he ran back and took his jacket off the back of the chair. Since he was away for quite a while, Wynne, who had been coming in and out, brought an old dented cloche to put over his dinner as both of them watched through the open door into the dark passageway. The two dogs, so inert a short while previous, raised an ongoing terrible howl as if catastrophe was about to befall the house. Wynne said it portended thunder as they never yelped at visitors, not even at tradesmen, but the onset of thunder always sent them crazy. She predicted that presently there would be flashes of lightning. The grounds and the meadow intermittently lit up. They waited, but the summer lightning did not come. I wonder what's keeping him, Wynne said. Uh, he's not used to drink, Mona said quietly. Lovely man, lovely smile, Wynne said, and again looked, expecting him to appear in that quick, stealth-like way of his. At length, Wynne said, Do you think I should get Jack to go and investigate? They had left the dining room and were in the hallway facing the door that said gents, with the metal G askew on a loose, rusted nail. Mona thought how awful if he had passed out and how ashamed he would be. Jack was summoned from where he was stationed, close up to the television screen, and rising he muttered something, then went into the gents and closed the door behind him. Soon Wynne pushed it in so that they could be of assistance. He's not here, Jack called. But where is he then, Wynne shouted. He went out. He got change for the payphone, Jack said. 
and instantly she guessed that he had gone to phone one of his comrades to come for her, as he would have to disappear. The dogs were already on the avenue, running back and forth in a froth, and ready to tear anyone to pieces. Both women ran, and Jack followed behind, calling after them. People stood on the far side of the gate, muted and in shock. Shane lay half in and half out of the telephone kiosk, his eyes, his tobacco-coloured eyes, still open, staring up at the sky with its few isolated stars. He was gasping to say something, but the strength had almost left him. He could not say what he most wanted to say. The onlookers stood in a huddle, baffled, not knowing who they were looking at or why he had been slain while simply making a telephone call. The guards had already been called and one woman who had been first on the scene said she had heard him repeatedly utter, Oh Jesus, Oh Mary. But her companion stoutly contradicted that. Mona wanted to kneel by him and shut his eyes but she was too afraid to stir. If only someone would shut his eyes, but she dared not for fear of them. He looked so desolate and so unbefriended, the breath just ebbing away. And the instant it left him, she let out a terrible cry. He was dead. Dead for a cause that others did not believe in. And as if on cue, a youth who had been going by stopped dismounted his black, brutish motorcycle, threw down his helmet, and crossed with the officiousness of a pallbearer. Looking down at the corpse, he recognised Shane and repeated his name with evident outrage and disgust. He seemed almost ready to kick him. The group recoiled, stricken, not only with fear, but with revulsion. The brief spate of pity had turned ugly. Wind shrieked at Mona, a murderer. You bought a murderer under my roof where my grandchildren slept and then lunged fiercely as Jack caught her, repeating the same phrase over and over again. It's all right, it's all right, he's history now, he can't harm us anymore. The police cars had arrived and big burly men in a lather of curiosity and vindication hurried to look at the assassin in whose bloody death they rejoiced. What goes around, comes around, one said repeatedly. Those that had been first on the scene were told to drive to the police station in the town, while Jack, Wynne and Mona were ordered back to the hotel for interrogation. Jack and Wynne hurried on as the dopey girl and a boy came out to meet them, clinging to each other for protection. Mona lagged behind, dreading their questions, and their abhorrence of her. It had begun to drizzle. A brooding quiet filled the entire landscape and the trees drank in the moisture. There would be another death to undo his and still another and another in the long, grim chain of reprisals. Hard to think that in the valleys murder lurked as from the meadow there came not even a murmur. The lambs in their fetal sleep innocent of slaughter.